There is a crisis of loneliness in the United States. It began before the pandemic and it has only gotten worse. Today's guest explores the risks people will take to find belonging, to find purpose, and to find love. She's novelist Tara Isabella Burton this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. And I'm G. Wayne Miller, also with Salve's Pell Center. And our guest this week is the multi-talented author and theologian, Tara Isabella Burton, whose new novel, Here in Avalon, is out now. Tara, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thank you so much for having me. So uh, this is a repeat performance because we had you on uh, earlier this year, er, er, earlier in 2023, talking about um, your previous book. Uh, tell us a little bit about Here is Avalon. Uh, so Here in Avalon is basically the story of two adult sisters in contemporary New York who one by one fall under the spell of a mysterious immersive theater cabaret troupe that may or may not be a cult and may or may not be supernatural. That is just enough to sort of whet your appetite, right? <laughs> um, do uh, so. W as, as I read this book and I was enthralled by it, and I, I love your writing. The question that I kept coming back to, though, was the current um, sort of the state of loneliness uh, in American society. The the current uh, Surgeon General has been warning about this for eight years at this point now. Um, the people who are in this book all are grappling with that sense of loneliness and belonging and seeking something more. Absolutely. It's for me, this is a book about the, the search for transcendence, it's about the search for enchantment, but it's also about the search for a home. These, these two very different sisters who have dealt in very different ways to their sort of unorthodox upbringing, both find uh, one after the other in this mysterious world that they're not quite sure what it is. Uh, an answer or at least a partial answer to what they're looking for and for me it was really important to write a book about kind of that quest for what we don't have in particularly in this 2023 American life where so much of our life is we're trying to hack it we're trying to get it right we have all of these these apps and these options and these uh, life hacks available to us and yet at the end of the day so many of us feel like this isn't enough. Something else must be possible. So these, these life hacks and these apps play a role in the book. And there's almost something uh, ritualistic about it. Uh, they're, gonna, they're trying to figure out how to do something new in their life, and so they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna listen to that app, or they're going to listen to that, that pod, or whatever it is. Um, is it a new religion? <laughs> Uh, I've argued that in the past. Uh, I think this book is not explicitly about religion, but I'm a theologian. All my books are a little bit about religion. And um, I think that I take perhaps a bit of a comic satirical eye to the kind of life hacking world that the protagonist Rose and her fiance uh, Caleb, who are both in the startup world, uh, belong to. But at the same time, I didn't just want to make this a book about the, the silly life hack version versus the real magic of fairyland. I wanted to <laughs> portray a book where Everybody, even the like most annoying characters in the book, uh, are trying to find something. Everyone's in the same struggle together. And I, I hope that in early parts of the book, particularly as the protagonist, Rose, realizes through her experiences with the Avalon that her life is not enough, it's not satisfactory. She's drawn in to this other mysterious world. But then she, like in all fairy tales about going into an enchanted realm, even a sort of modern fairy tale like this one, the question is what happens when you come back out? Do you come back out? What pulls you back to the real world and is the real world worth living in? And uh, even if it's not, can you really get away from it? So I was drawn into this book literally from page one and it's, it's an incredible work, uh, totally loved it. A lot of really great characters. You've named two of them so far. So let's start with a little bit of a description of the two sisters, starting with Rose. What is Rose in, quote unquote, the real world before Avalon comes into her life? 
What, what is she doing? Where has she been? What was her background like? So Rose, who's the, uh, the responsible younger sister of, of these two siblings, uh, she'd wanted to be an artist, uh, didn't feel this was practical, and went into uh, basically uh, the tech world. And she works for a, a startup designing uh, functionally a, a, a series of meditation apps that help people get in touch with uh, solving their personal problems through these, these guided meditation tracks. And she's very comfortable and confident in her life. She has everything under control. It's very regimented. She has a, a fiance that she, she thinks she loves. She definitely looks up to and admires. And what is important for her is to feel that her life is under her control and that even if as a child, she, like her much more wayward sister, uh, had different dreams, different goals or expectations, that what it means to be an adult is to put those things away and put childish things away. And uh, it's precisely that definition of adulthood that gets challenged in her interaction with the Avalon. So tell us about Cecilia, her <laughs> sister, who in many ways is completely different than Rose, but in some ways is very similar. We'll get to that in a bit. But Absolutely. Cecilia. Uh, well, is Cecilia's she? just a mess. Uh, I, 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 it's funny, I, I thought very much I was modeling both the characters on myself, but everyone who uh, reads the book, even if they don't mo know me, uh, perhaps rightly suspects that my uh, I'm more of a Cecilia than a Rose. But she's impetuous. <laughs> I would sorry. disagree with that, but anyway. He's tempestuous and impetuous, always getting into sort of scrapes from childhood onwards, always running in search of the next big thing, whether it's a, a hasty marriage or uh, a time in a monastery or running off here, running off there. She wants not just to fall in love, but to have the biggest, grandest, most poetic love of all time. And this desire to throw herself into glorious, stupid things is incredibly damaging, but also in some ways incredibly noble. And so much of her relationship is Rose's, with Rose is Rose's anger that why does my sister keep getting herself into these messes? Why does my sister keep leaving me? And at the same time, is there something in what she's looking for, even as every time she tries to get it, she kind of blows up everybody's life in the process? How do you, how do you, how do you create these characters? Are they fully formed by the time you actually start writing, or do they emerge sort of in the process of writing? So, because you just gave us sort of, you know, uh, a treatment about each of these characters that's in depth and nuance that you have the benefit of knowing how the book is going to end. How much of those character those are built in your head when you sit down and start writing? Uh, almost none. Which is to say, I, I had sort of people I knew that were vague models for these characters, also parts of myself and moments in my life that were vague models for each of these characters. But both of them went through a lot of permutations. Uh, more Rose than Cecilia, but there was sort of an, they, they didn't always have those names. Uh, there, was, there were earlier versions where uh, Rose was but honestly, both characters were much more annoying or exaggerated. <laughs> I think uh, earlier versions of Cecilia were so selfish and disastrous and didn't have that, that kind of nobility that made her lovable despite her chaos. Uh, and I think earlier versions of Rose were much more self, not just self-confident, but um, smug. And I think it, it was only when I allowed the, the sisters to love each other as much as they hated each other early on for their relationship to, to work. Where when, when it, you know, I think it was very easy, and I think it's often easy with stories about two sisters, uh, there, are, there are so many, to kind of make each of them a stand-in for certain qualities and their opposites. And you know, Sense and Sensibility works like this. Yep. Uh, to a lesser extent, Goblin Market, another model of the story uh, works, for the story works like this. But what interested me is that ultimately these are human beings, not types. And the more I rewrote the book, and this book went through like four or five drafts from scratch. Like I, every time I'd read it and be like, this is terrible and throw it out and stuff. Really? Over. You literally threw it out? Oh yeah, three or four times. Uh, this is, oh, wow. uh, I think my poor editor, she'd give me line edits and I'd come back to her and say, hi, so I've actually rewritten the entire book. <laughs> <laughs> the lines that you edited aren't in there. Uh, she needs but to go thanks. to Avalon. <laughs> uh, so sorry, yes, you please go and <laughs> escape me for a while. But every single draft, the sisters got closer. They got more similar, uh, closer in the sense of closer to each other temperamentally and also more similar. And it became more and more apparent to me that there, 
they were defining themselves in opposition to each other. It's not that, you know, one character, one of them is the messy one because she's, she is messy and one of them is neat because she is neat. It's, they're, they're constantly reacting to each other, trying to define themselves against each other. I am not like my sister in this way. I am making this choice because, because my sister wouldn't make it. And I think it is only as they both find themselves drawn to the Avalon, both discover in the Avalon different things that draw them to it. I think Cecilia finds stability and family and Rose finds excitement and adventure. But they are, it is precisely in figuring out that these were human beings who loved each other and not uh, stand-ins for qualities that these became people and not just sort of archetypes, which is always the challenge of working within this sort of fairy tale adjacent setting. And the book, I will, the book is not particularly supernatural, but the model of the fairy tale uh, from the first line is something that I wanted to play with, even as I felt so strongly about setting it in, this is a story that is set in the real world with real people, not with archetypes. So the sisters both wind up in Avalon. Give us a little bit more about Avalon, what it is. It's a traveling cabaret. It's a boat that plies New York waterways, and it's also a residence on land. But Oh, Give well, us more. What is Avalon? Don't want to spoil too much, but what we know uh, early on about Avalon, the Avalon, is that it, there's a mysterious red boat that appears at night to certain people who know where and when to wait for it, that uh, mysterious people sort of travel through New York giving uh, the lost, the lonely, the brokenhearted, people who seem like they need it, information about where to find this boat. And some people uh, have one incredible experience of that they don't quite know, is this real, is this fake, is this happening, is this supernatural? Uh, and some people seem to get obsessed with this boat, with this boat, and then vanish. You know, uh, it's, it occurs to me, I've read two of your books now, um, and, and so I've got some more work to do, but it occurs huh. to me that one of the recurring themes in your work is um, sort of hidden knowledge, uh, sort of the esoteric, truths that uh, maybe are hidden from some, but people are trying to gain access to. Um, I know you've studied theology. You are a theologian. Yes. Um, what does that mean to you? What, what does the appeal of that hidden knowledge mean to you? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting that I, I wouldn't have thought of it as hidden knowledge, but now that you say it, I think that's right. I think a, a recurring theme in my work is the, it is certainly the desire for enchantment, but it's the tension between particular desires for the hidden version of enchantment, the kind of special secret uh, knowledge that other people don't have uh, in The World Cannot Give. My last novel, uh, the, the, one of the protagonists, Virginia, is attracted to this very uh, traditionalist aesthetic form of Catholicism, in part to sort of set herself above other people in a way that only a 16-year-old girl can do. Uh, in this book, The Avalon, this sort of mysterious, maybe supernatural, maybe cultish place takes that role. But what interests me is the kind of is, is, is the tension between the, that aesthetic hiddenness, the idea that you could find the secret, and a, a loving way of apprehending the world where everything is enchanted, where everybody is worthy of love, of dignity. It's one of my uh, biggest convictions in, in writing fiction that there should never be a character that isn't a human being, isn't worthy of love, even if they're really, really annoying. I, in fact, my favorite <laughs> characters uh, I've, in, in the fiction I write are the, uh, the really annoying ones that get humanized through the book, uh, Bonnie in The World Cannot Give, Lydia in, in Avalon, uh, who might be one of my favorite characters ever written. And it's precisely for me that, that tension uh, as a novelist between the hunger for the aesthetic, for the slightly rarefied world, and then how do you deal with just being a human being in the world and loving people as they are and seeing in the world as it is something that is worthy of our attention without the bells and whistles of uh, certain kinds of uh, aesthetic superiority. And uh, without giving too much away about what the Avalon really is, uh, what the Morgan, the mysterious Morgan, the leader of the Avalon, believes is that the real world isn't worth living in, that only in this artificial paradise can he, the people that she chooses, the special people, uh, achieve some kind of respite from reality. And the question is, 
What does that mean for the people left behind? So the, 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 the respite, though, that they seem to be had, to seem to receive is that they're going to be part of this community, that they're going to be part of something bigger than themselves. And I found in that um, sort of a, 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 a something inspiring. There was, there was a, a old commencement address uh, by Bud Giamatti, who had been the president at Yale and the commissioner of Major League Baseball. And the last line of it really struck me, and it stayed with me, but it's about the idea that the most inhumane thing that you can let somebody be is alone. Mm. And that struck me as I was reading your book, and I had recently read that speech, that there's a, that there's a commonality in that, that, that what this, 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 this Shangri-La that they're promising is a place of belonging. Absolutely, uh, and I think that's the, the most wonderful part about it, even as the, there's this tension between you give up the whole world and you, there are people left behind, and we, we meet some of the people left behind who, who suffer because they have lost people to the Avalon, and it's only in kind of recognizing this double-edged sword of the Avalon as a community, as a place that both does, in fact, offer real things, good things to the, the people in it, except for a few people who wind up dead, but we'll get to that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but also that there is a real cost. There, this, there's no way to get out of the real world, uh, even in a book about a kind of ostensible fairyland. And it's, it's precisely the, the sort of idea of fairyland that uh, it was not in early drafts of the Avalon, ironically. The early drafts of the Avalon was much more driven by the idea of either by cults and by particular sort of Arthurian legend. And there was an offhand line where uh, Paul is, says, and it was in an earlier draft too, um, one character refers to Cecilia as going off with the fairies. And it was like a light went off. And I realized that the, what I find so interesting about fairies as a sort of archetype is that unlike you know, witches or demons or what have you, they're very morally neutral. Like yeah. Christian stories, secular stories, there's a kind of fairies are beyond good and evil and they're kind of childlike. And the worlds that they offer are appealing and desirable, uh, but they're often, not always, but like often coded as not quite as dangerous or demonic as they might otherwise be. They're, they're innocent in a certain way, but they're also shut out of something bigger or more glorious. And that, that vision of this kind of something that is better than what the real world seems, but worse than what the real world can be, that it's a vision of escape, but also a sort of vision of, of childlike innocence in a certain way. That idea of fairyland began to be really dominant as I, I redrafted and redrafted the book. And ultimately, um, the, you know, this, the, the book as a kind of slightly suspenseful, slightly gothic fairy tale came to me precisely because I was interested in that interplay between, again, the hidden knowledge and the real world. And, you know, these are the the mythological figures that often deal with both of those states. So one of the overarching themes of the book is life and the meaning of life. And of course, the pursuit of, of that question has been a quest for centuries and before historical time. I want to read this reflection. Cecilia at one point says, quote, life is probably a tragedy. True love is an illusion. Nobody ever finds what they're looking for, and everybody dies in the end. Do you agree with that? Should we? I don't think life is a tragedy, but I'm, a, I'm coming at it from a Christian perspective. You've got to think of life as a comedy with a happy ending or eschatologically on a, a broad horizon. But I think it is true. Like all of the things that Cecilia says are true, uh, that everybody dies and that we don't ever find exactly what we're looking for in this life. And... I think one of the questions that the characters have in this book is the question of what genre am I living in? What story am I living in? Am I living in a comedy? Am I living in a tragedy? Am I living in a fairy tale? Am I living in something else entirely? But trying to figure, both wanting life to not, Cecilia, a younger Cecilia, wants her life to be like art. But I think both characters, as they mature, start thinking more about, is life meaningful enough to have this kind of weight to be talked about as a tragedy or a comedy. Uh, and I think Here in Avalon might be my least tragic novel. Uh, it's maybe my most comic, uh, or, or at least a tragedy comic. And I, I think that what I, what I wanted to do with it is 
provide a vision of, provide a sense that life is worth living, even though the facts of what Cecilia says are true. Wow. So what would a Buddhist make of reading this book? Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> not sure how to answer that one. Oh, gee, uh, years. <laughs> um, I think, I, I mean, I don't have, but let me think about how to answer that. Without having a sort of robust and detailed knowledge of Buddhism, I would imagine that a vision, uh, a vision of life is fundamentally one of suffering uh, where attachment does not have certain kinds of redeeming factors uh, would not be compatible with the kind of worldview I want to play with here. And the, uh, so I'm getting at being very reductionist in how I, how I frame that. But I, I think for me, what interests me about the world of, uh, of this novel is, that, is, the real, is the idea that is precisely in our attachments to one another, at least, if not to things, that we do find a uh, a kind of reality that there is, it is in being responsible to one another, in being um, kind of linked to one another. Cecilia's relationship with Rose, Cecilia's relationship with her estranged husband Paul, and the fact that they're still married despite the fact that their relationship was a giant disaster. These are bonds that do need to be taken seriously and to kind of anchor the reality of the book. And it's precisely in the breaking of those bonds that the Avalon both provides this incredible escape and is a little bit more sinister than it might seem. You, uh, in the, in the, in the pre-publication copies that we read, you acknowledged some, some early inspirations for the book. Um, can you share those with us and our audience? Sure. So there, there's three big personal inspirations I have for uh, here in Avalon. The first, the most obvious one, is uh, in my early 20s, I was an obsessive super fan of an immersive theater production in New York City called Sleep No More, which is actually closing at the end of January 2024, same month of the publication of this book, so very, very bittersweet. Uh, and it's, you know, you, would, you could wander through this 100-room lovingly decorated 1930s sort of mansion that's also a forest, that's also a graveyard, and it's a, a retelling of, I guess I would say, a, the Scottish play uh, with a little bit of Hitchcock. And you, um, you, you kind of get to wander through the space. And I went like 13 times, which by the standards of my fellow super fans was nothing. <laughs> I, knew people, I, went, I knew people went like 200, 300 times. Wow. Who all really? of the, They were not like wow. wildly wealthy people. All of their disposable income went on going back into the space, following the actors being in this enchanted world. What was the appeal? <sighs> Everyone has a different uh, version of this. Uh, part of it was the kind of, uh, when I say erotic, I don't mean like for one particular actor, but the experience of being in this sort of altered, magical, sensual existence where actors might take you into a private room and whisper a story into your ear or kiss your cheek. There was this sort of sense that you were in a heightened other reality where you were also a heightened human being. Um, and sort of ironically, as I, I, I think about this now, I didn't realize at this time, but it was precisely in my attachment to this, this show, this world, this altered reality that made me realize something was missing from my life, probably brought me back to organized religion, uh, despite the fact that I spent most of the time in the sleep no more following uh, the, the Hecate and the witches around. Um, <laughs> but uh, this, so, so sleep no more is the big one. The, the other uh, big inspiration is a community uh, that really fascinates me. I actually stole another life as possible from them. It's an Anabaptist community called the Bruderhof that I came across because I often write for a magazine called Plow that they publish that's, that's sort of about faith and also about culture. And it's uh, the complete opposite. It's not um, <laughs> sexy at all. It's this uh, pacifist Christian community uh, that has many uh, branches, including a couple in the Hudson River Valley where I visited, where people dress very simply, uh, live uh, with communal property, and have this sort of pacifist communitarian life. And of course, uh, I'm sure, like any community, uh, there it is not a perfect place. There's no such thing as a utopia in this world. But during a, a difficult time in my life a few years ago, I got to know some of these, these folks. And I was really struck by, and at one point, like very, very briefly wondering, like, should, should I just do this? Should I join? Should I give it all up and you know, live on the farm with the baby goats and give up everything I have and just be part of this in, incredibly supportive community? And uh, 
while for, for many, many reasons that was not the right call, uh, I still visit a lot of the time and I'm still fascinated by uh, the pull of the idea that another life is possible, that it doesn't have to be this way, this way being, you know, Instagram saturated 2023 status obsessed where I live, New York City. And um, so in a sense, the Avalon uh, is inspired by these two very, very different worlds, this sort of seductive, magical, witchy world, and this slightly idealized uh, community. I think uh, intense communities that, uh, the idea of an intense community, an intense intentional community uh, was one that fascinated me even as I wanted to kind of explore the, the spookier, more potentially supernatural, potentially cultish version. And I, I think about this a lot because I, I write about cults a lot in my nonfiction as well. And uh, one of the things that often comes across is that like the number of people that have like after a couple of drinks confessed to me, like normal people, friends of mine, Sometimes I just wish I could join a cult. <laughs> like, would it really be so bad to be part of a cult and live in a compound? And uh, without saying that here in Avalon is about the good of cults, uh, I think it's about the appeal of intense, uh, intense communities that offer a sense of meaning and purpose and can create a world that seems to matter. That is where we need to leave it. Tara Isabella Burton, the book is here in Avalon. Thank you so much for being with us. That is all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on social media or visit PellCenter.org. He's Wayne, I'm Jim, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square. Mm -hmm.